Good morning or afternoon. This is Janie Montblanc, um, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar showcasing SAGE Success Project Highlights. There will be three 10-minute presentations by U.S. Geological Survey researchers involved in the project. Today's three presentations are the History, Study Design, and Partnerships of the SAGE Success Project, presented by David Pilliad. Big Picture Considerations for Sagebrush Restoration by Matt Germino. And Is Resistance and Resilience a Useful Predictive Tool by Robert Arkell. Before I introduce our presenters, I will go over some webinar details. We will be taking questions after each short presentation as well as at the end of all three. If you have questions or comments, please type them into the questions window of your control panel located at the top right of your screen. Please feel free to submit questions during the webinar as it's nice to have some ready in the queue. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar, so you're welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio window and check your audio selections. Now I will introduce our presenters. David Pilliad is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey Forest and Rangeland Ecosystem Science Center in Boise, Idaho. His research focuses on the restoration and conservation of wildlife habitats and populations in the Great Basin and Intermountain West. He is the lead scientist on the SAGE Success Project. Welcome, David. Thank you very much. So we have three 10-minute presentations for you today, and these are um, highlighting some of the initial and, and uh, important findings from the SAGE Success Project. And I'm going to kick off by giving a little history and, and study design and partnerships with the SAGE Success Project um, to set the context for all of this. This is an interagency project. It was funded by the U.S. Geological Survey, BLM, Fish and Wildlife Service, and the LCCs out of the Great Basin. We've been working on this for the last five years. So the research team is composed of six PIs spread across the geographic west, uh, John Bradford's in Flagstaff, Mike Dunaway, oops, excuse me, is in uh, Moab, Matt Germino in Boise, Dan Manier in Fort Collins. I'm here in Boise and Dave Pikes in Corvallis. And as many large projects like this entail, we have several contributing scientists that are um, played key roles in the project. Oh, it just showed up. Is it acting slow? All right, now can you see that? Yes. All right, very good, we're on our way. <laughs> okay, so um, as I was going through the, the this, I was saying that the contributing scientists, um, I, I don't have time to list everybody, but three are gonna be presenting as part of this webinar series. Robert Arkell works on my team. Uh, Dave Bernard is in Matt Germino's lab and Bob Shriver's in uh, John Bradford's lab. So the problem really at the root of this project is, is too much wildfire. And this is not a new issue. Uh, back in 1978, Young and Evans wrote that the reestablishment of downy brome dominance predisposes the vegetation to reoccurring wildfires and cyclic environmental degradation. That was 40 years ago, um, and, it, and we've been tracking this uh, issue for a long time, and it culminated in a secretarial order in 2015 where Sally Jewell wrote that uh, we needed a, to enhance policies and strategies for preventing and suppressing rangeland fire and for restoring sagebrush landscapes impacted by wildfire. Well, since that secretarial order, here are the statistics of the acreage burned in habitats of the greater sage grouse. And you can see that the acreage is in the millions, or around uh, four and a half million acres in the last three years. A lot of that is coming out of Nevada, and uh, the majority of that is on BLM lands. Now, to counter wildfire, the, really the only solution is to get uh, sagebrush to reestablish somehow. And the, Two most common ways to do that is with aerial seeding and drill seeding. Um, 
on the bottom there, I show a figure of the acreage of big sagebrush seeded. This is data coming out of Land Treatment Digital Library. And so just between 2000 and 2009, there was about 5 million acres that were seeded with big sagebrush. And if you were to go from 2010 to present, that number would be even higher. So it's not for lack of trying. Um, the question really came down to um, how successful are we? And some of the scientists on this team began to investigate this problem about a decade ago. And uh, the paper in Journal of Applied Ecology, some of you are familiar with, concluded that seeding native shrubs, particularly sagebrush, big sagebrush, did not increase shrub cover or density in burned areas. And if you look at those two figures, the top figure is for aerial seeding and the bottom figure is for drill seeding. What we found is eight to 20 years after seeding, there was no difference between areas that had been aerial seeded and those that had burned, but were not seeded at all. And you can compare those to unburned areas and see that there's about 20% cover of sagebrush in unburned areas and about 5% cover in these seeded or not seeded burned areas. And it didn't matter whether it was aerial seeded or drill seeding. So there was a real problem here of, of these methods of, of getting sagebrush to reestablish, but it didn't answer the question of why. And so we decided to launch this new project to get at that question of how do we learn from the past to improve restoration outcomes. The Sage Success Project really has two primary objectives. Uh, the first is to assess where and why post-fire seeding and planting practices are successfully establishing big sagebrush, and then to tie that to sage grouse habitat. And so these, these uh, two objectives really came out of the uh, science action uh, plan, which was part of the integrated Ransland fire management strategy. And that was to determine the criteria and thresholds that indicate restoration and rehabilitation success across the range of environmental conditions that characterize sage grouse habitat, and to conduct retrospective studies of selective native plant restoration to evaluate short and long term responses of plant communities to these treatments and to biotic and abiotic conditions. So, we're really responding to this, this uh, actionable science plan directly. We've learned a lot from past work, and so we decided that keys to success were going to be threefold. First would be to engage partners early to incorporate their ideas. And we did that by having uh, a series of conference calls with Bureau of Land Management and other partners to find out what are the questions that were most pressing and how do we design the, the study to be effective in terms of integrating various uh, interests and needs of, of partners. The second was to maintain communication throughout the project life cycle so there was no surprises and that there was um, you know, back and forth of communication. And then ultimately in the phase we're in now, which is communicate science findings to managers and hopefully do that effectively. So we started out by wanting to maximize inference for sagebrush seeding treatments. And this map on the left shows all of the big sagebrush seedings that have occurred in, in the Western US. And this is based on BLM records in the LTDL. And the map on the right just shows the number of seeding treatments that we had to work with. So essentially, this is our population of uh, sagebrush seeding treatments. And then we were going to sample from that population. So we maximized our inference. But to do this, we had to come up with a few sampling rules. And some of these rules came from those early interactions of communication with partners of finding out what were the most important issues for them. The first was to focus on the Great Basin. And this is because the cheatgrass fire cycle and a lot of the increased fire frequency issues are happening in the Great Basin. And so we were able to focus on that area instead of across the entire range of the sage grouse. The second was to take all treatments with ardor seeding or big sagebrush seeding, um, not just pick ones in, in deeper loamy soils or places that had burned once, which were the criteria for that earlier work that I showed. But we also realized that time results in wildfire uh, happening post-treatment. And so we had to remove areas of treatment that had burned since seeding. And that was a common occurrence. And you can see on that map on the bottom right, those black areas are overlapping with our seeded areas, um, where areas that had been seeded with sagebrush then subsequently burned. And then we also had issues of multiple seedings overlapping. And so we chose to use the most recent seeding. <clears throat> 
The third rule was to include known sites where sagebrush were successfully established. This was working with individual field offices to find out where they were particularly successful, go to those places and find out what was it about those seeding treatments that allowed sagebrush to be successful compared to other places. Number four was to assess sampling biases of random plot placement when, a, when sagebrush establishment may be patchy. This idea that um, what is a successful seeding uh, if you think of a thousand acres seeded, if a hundred acres successfully established, that might still be successful and that might be due to the patchy nature of the soils or other characteristics. And so we did look at that question. And then lastly, to assess the success of hand plantings relative to seedings. Um, hand plantings are increasing in frequency and so we wanted to understand uh, the trade-offs. In total, we have about 1,400 plots spread across 284 wildfires, and they were sampled between 2014 and 2017. In the map, the, the green dots are places where sagebrush was detected. So these are seeding treatments where sagebrush was detected, and then the white or gray dots are sagebrush not detected. So some places where we went, we didn't detect any sagebrush growing. Uh, the plot on the right is a frequency distribution of, of these detected and non-detected plots uh, spread across elevation. And this was important to us because we didn't want to just be sampling at higher elevations or at lower elevations and biasing our results. We wanted to make sure that our distribution of plots spread across the range of elevations that you mount and counter, uh, particularly because higher elevations would be more likely to have successful uh, recruitment because of higher moisture levels. I'm not going to go into the details of our methods, but I just will point out um, a few of the things that are key. First of all, we used a, a three-spoke, 50-meter spoke design for our plots. We used line point intercept. We also used shrub belts to get at density, measured height. We took soil samples at all of our plots at different depths, including depth to a restrictive layer. We also looked at soil surface characteristics, pediderm to understand characteristics associated with uh, the biological crust, for example. And lastly, we took uh, tissue samples from sagebrush within our plots and then areas that appeared to be fairly undisturbed as a reference area to understand the um, basically seed source information of where the sagebrush uh, seedlings were coming from. We used treatment data from the Land Treatment Digital Library and weather data from uh, GridMet and PRISM. And all of this fed into me mechanistic and statistical models shown on the right, and, and some of these uh, will be presented in the following uh, presentations. So we have a smorgasbord of presentations here. These are what's happening today. We have the big picture considerations of sagebrush restoration uh, presented by Matt Germino, and is resistance and resilience a useful predictive tool by Robert Arkell. And then tomorrow we have feature presentations right here at the same time, same place, uh, by Dave Bernard talking about soils, Bob Shriver talking about uh, sagebrush population trajectories, and then ultimately finishing up Dave Pike looking at the question of whether to plant or to seed. So that's what we have for uh, the, the coverage of, of what we've accomplished so far, but I did wanna point out that this isn't the end of all the products. We have several more coming. Um, and we probably will have a follow-up webinar to um, cover those, but this is a majority of uh, what we've been working on in the last five years. Great, thanks, David. All right, Matt, I will um, make you the presenter. And if you have any questions for David right now, feel free to type them in. A couple of people have asked about the webinars being recorded. And um, yes, they will be, and the link will be automatically sent to you through this GoToWebinar system tomorrow. But you can always email me for that as well. Um, okay. So Matt, I'll wait until we have your, oh, there we go. Okay. Matt Germino is a supervisory research ecologist with the USGS in Boise, where he oversees a research group focusing on restoration of sagebrush rangelands affected by fire and invasive plants. His background is plant ecology and physiology, and he is active leading or advising science management partnerships in the Great Basin. Welcome, Matt. Thank you. 
So, and there were, it looked like there were no questions for David, so you can power forward. <laughs> okay, great. So we often hear that uh, sagebrush steppe ecosystems appear like a homogeneous sea, but uh, those of us who have worked in these ecosystems know that um, that's not quite true. There's actually a tremendous amount of variability both within and especially among sites. And this variability is really critical to, um, to appreciate and to understand um, if we're ever going to conserve and restore these ecosystems um, in the way that we all hope. And um, actually all of the talks that we're going to hear um, arguably revolve around this point of heterogeneity. And uh, my, my talk actually um, is somewhat uh, uh, not appropriately titled because I'm actually going to dive into some of the details on the biological diversity um, in these ecosystems, specifically hey, within Sagebrush. Hey, yes. Matt, I'm going to jump in really quick. Um, it's mm -hmm. I know we tested your sound earlier, but it's weird. It's like going in and out sometimes. Some things you say are clear, and then sometimes it's very muffled. Okay. So I, I don't know if there's anything you can do to change that. And if not, um, if you if you wanted to switch to the phone, we could do that too. I don't know what you prefer. I'm holding the microphone up to my mouth now. Is that a little bit better? That's even worse. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Um, let me go jump over into Robert's office, which is right next door. Okay, sounds good. And actually, one question did come in for David. So if okay. you're still on, we can answer that question while we wait for Matt. Thank you, Matt. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so David, um, a question came in. Were any soil surface treatments included in this work, i.e. mulch? Also, how were biological soil crusts measured? Uh, you lost it? What's that? Oh. I'm sorry, we're having technical difficulties on our <laughs> side. Um, yeah, I have it on mine, so you can jump on mine, Matt. Um, the question was, we, um, no, problem, mulch, no, um, but there was herbicide applications in some cases, and we have those data to try to tease some of that out. And then did you um, measure bi biological soil crusts, and if so, how? We did using a pediderm method. And more of that will be covered under Dave Bernard's um, uh, presentation tomorrow at 12:30. Okay, great, thank you. Yep. So I'm Matt's coming into my office. We're gonna get him switched over here. So if you could pass the baton back to my computer. Oh, okay, we'll do that. And you want me to do that right now? Yes, please. Okay. Okay. Can it's you on the, now? Yeah, it's on the notes page, though. So if you could go up to the display settings. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All good? Yeah. Perfect. Thanks. Great. Okay. So um, sagebrush ecosystems are not so homogenous. They're highly variable in time. Um, as Stuart Hardegree is showing us here in this graph, um, sagebrush ecosystems might normally get between 100 and 400 millimeters of precipitation per year. And here you can see the variability in spring precipitation. Just one month, May, um, is highly variable compared to that uh, mean annual precipitation. And this is critical considering that uh, young sagebrush seeds might be germinating, especially uh, trying to survive and grow during this, this uh, critical spring period. This generates quite a bit of of variability and um, this also complicates uh, post-fire management um, treatment applications. I'm going to focus a little bit more on uh, the biological basis and relationships to spatial variability in big sagebrush. Um, so here across the the range of big sagebrush you know there's quite a bit of climate variability especially when you go from the summer dry rain shadows of the Cascades in the Sierra Nevada and you move eastward to the summer wet um, areas of, um, of Wyoming and eastern Montana, considerable climate dis uh, differences. But some of the most important 
climate variation actually occurs within a lo locality, such as shown in this photo here. And those of you with a trained eye already are probably recognizing that within a few feet of one another, you can see larger shrubs and smaller shrubs. That variability could well um, have a genetic basis. And similarly, in the background at the tops of the mountains, um, we know that the sagebrush are experiencing a different environment and probably have a very different genetic constitution than, let's say, the sagebrush down in the draw along this creek or on this, um, this basin, this flat, flatland. And the way that um, scientists and managers have traditionally dealt with this di diversity, in part, is to recognize um, these different uh, subspecies of big sagebrush. And the, the simplest, most commonly accepted uh, rubric for this is that <clears throat> morphological traits can be used to identify three, these three different subspecies. At the highest elevations, you've got mountain big sagebrush, coolest and wettest sites. Um, and our common garden experiments, where we've planted all these subspecies together, show that indeed this subspecies has very different um, physiological adaptation than the other, um, the other subspecies, although not all the diversity can be explained um, by these distinctions, as I'll show. Anyways, lower elevations on the uh, broad plains or sometimes dry ridges, shallower soils, you, you can find Wyoming big sagebrush. Um, this the species tends to occur uh, where we see more problems with invasive annual grasses and wildfire. And then in the most fertile soils of our bottomlands, we see basin big sagebrush, subspecies Tridentata. This species is morphologically distinguished, we're told, by its tall height, its long slender leaves. By the way, I should note, all big sagebrush have long slender leaves. leaves. It's just that the leaves are longer and more slender um, in this subspecies. Also, it's <clears throat> thought to be distinguished by having a single uh, large trunk rather than branching at the base like we find in mountain and um, Wyoming big sagebrush. Furthermore, the um, leaf chemistry differs amongst these species. Mountain big sagebrush is uh, much more palatable and the compounds that underlie that palatability exhibit UV um, flu uh, fluorescence emissions upon UV illumination. Um, now, moreover, there's diversity that's that's even more cryptic. So these traits, by the way, are not always that easy to distinguish in the field. So the diversity here is somewhat cryptic. But the most cryptic part is that uh, some of these subspecies um, can have either two or four um, copies of chromosomes within them, sets of chromosomes within them. And all subspecies are polyploid, but only basin and mountain can be diploid. And I'm telling you this because we've discovered in our common garden studies that these differences in, um, in what we call cytotype or ploidy have very strong effects on adaptation to drought and low temperatures, for example. We'll see more about their effects here in a moment. So for a thousand plants that we <clears throat> um, collected in both seeded as well as unseeded areas throughout the SAGE success study, um, we asked, how do all these traits group together? If we were to use objective um, multivariate ordination statistics on all of the traits, would the traits cluster out into those three subspecies that are so critical? I forgot to mention, these subspecies identifications are absolutely essential for conserving and especially restoring sagebrush depth. Number one, um, Sagebrush subspecies types are used to identify ecological site types. And as Robert will be describing to us um, in the next talk, those um, ecological site types are then used to predict and sometimes prescribe the restoration approaches uh, according to the resistance resilience theory. Um, moreover, um, sagebrush is so poorly adapted to fire with you know, short-lived seeds that don't disperse very long and the species is unable to re-sprout after fire. So seeding is, is generally required, especially on mega fires. The seed must be collected from wildland <clears throat> sources, natural populations. And um, 
the first cut for identifying an appropriate seed source is matching the subspecies to the site where you want to add the seed. Anyways, back to the topic here. When we group all of these traits that are used um, in, in man management as well as research to identify subspecies, we find that the traits don't parse neatly into three groups. Instead, they parse, most, they parse best into 10 unique groups. Now, what are those 10 groups? I'm gonna show a fairly complex graph here. Um, on the x-axis are five different groupings. T stands for Tridentata subspecies, uh, that's basin. W is Wyomingensis, Wyoming. V is Vassiana Mountain Big Sagebrush. X stands for Zeric Big Sagebrush, which is thought to be a stable hybrid. So hybridization is well known to occur. This is a stable hybrid that uh, we actually found to be relatively common across the range. Between, it's a hybrid between Basin and Mountain Big Sagebrush. Bonneville Big Sagebrush is a hybrid between Wyoming and Mountain Big Sagebrush. Now, uh, the gray bars up here are those diploids. The white are tetraploids. Uh, this sounds like a lot of detailed science, but I, believe me, I, I do believe this is a big picture problem um, when we think about how we're restoring these ecosystems. So across the sage success sites, we find, first of all, that Wyoming big sagebrush here in the second group of columns. Um, when you look at diploidy in combination with all these other traits, it does appear that we should be recognizing a diploid form. Moreover, the um, diploidy um, isn't such a binary thing. We, the theory tells us we should have diploids with a value of four and tetraploids with a value of eight. Here you can see there's actually quite a bit of variability between. So more of a gradient than a, <clears throat> a binary class of classification. Over here on the right, you can see um, the proportion of plants within each taxonomic group that um, were branched at the base. Basin big sagebrush, if you can recall, is supposedly not branched. Well, actually the data when you look at all the other traits, suggests that it very frequently is. So only 30% of the time might it have a single trunk, and that's really only in the diploid form of the subspecies. Okay, just examples of some of the the, um, the difference between what we are using as criteria to identify these species and what actually exists across the landscape. How about UV fluorescence? Indeed, mountain big sagebrush appears to have more UV fluorescence as, as we've been told by the taxonomists. The hybrids have progressively less. That seems to agree with what we've um, been using for a scoring rubric for diploids and tetraploids. How about um, <clears throat> mountain big sagebrush is supposed to have a birthday cake-like crown where the reproductive structures stick up above the, uh, the, the um, regular leaves on the plant. Well. That appears to be true only in the diploid and probably not the tetraploid forms. So a little bit of um, incongruence there with what we see compared to the taxonomic rubrics. Um, all sa big sagebrush leaves are long and narrow. Basin big sagebrush is supposed to have the longest and it appears to, but only in the diploid form. Wyoming big sagebrush is supposed to have a dome-like structure that really doesn't appear to hold up. Instead, all tetraploids appear to have that trait. How about plant height? Are, are taller plants more likely to have all the other morphological traits of basin big sagebrush? Yes, but here again, only in the diploid forms. Otherwise, that trait really isn't such a strong distinguishing factor as we, many of us, um, previously believed. Similarly, the uneven crown that's just supposed to be a trait only of, white, of a basin big sagebrush, again, is evident only in the diploids. So here, I'm trying to um, simplify uh, some very complex results that we have discovered that shows us that there is a lot more diversity within big sagebrush uh, taxonomy than we ever thought. In fact, when I see graphs like this, when I try to um, simplify this into one take-home message, I like to say that the word sagebrush is probably more analogous to the word tree than it is to any particular species of tree. Here's another complicating factor. 
ecological site descriptions often recognize one or maybe two subspecies of big sagebrush that might occur. How many of the different taxonomic groups or morphological types that we've identified occur on our sites? Your, as this graph shows, you're equally likely to see three, four, or five of these consistently identified uh, morphological groups as you are one or two. So there's a lot of diversity within a site. How much does this matter for seeding success? Well, we looked at 24 seedings uh, for which we had some rare and good uh, seed source information collected by the Boise District over many decades. And we surprisingly found that matching the right subspecies really didn't help us explain the success of uh, sagebrush recovery. However, there was another variable that was really a, a strong predictor, and that was uh, regarding the traits of the site where sagebrush was collected, sagebrush seed was collected, compared to the site where it was seeded. And specifically, the five seedings of the 24 treatments that had very high or and good sagebrush recovery happened, I think by chance, to have gotten their seed from areas that had almost identical minimum temperatures. And conversely, those sites that had um, no sagebrush recovery, there were 16 different um, fires treatments, they, those sites that had zero recovery got their seeds from areas that had much colder minimum temperatures. So this tells us that the population level variability is um, pretty important and the subspecies identity of the population, which we put so much emphasis on in research and in management, may not be as important as we think. Should we still consider subspecies identity? I think so. It's one of the only things that we have to work with and, um, and it, it probably does matter but certainly these other details are really key. Now, <clears throat> um, the other talks that you're gonna hear are gonna dive a little bit more into the heterogeneity um, that exists in sagebrush recovery. Um, and the, the key point here is by understanding this heterogeneity, we're going to better be able to better predict where, when, and why sagebrush do or do not recover. We're hoping to fold this information up into the land treatment exploration tool that's being developed here in the USGS. And I'd like to point out that um, all of these things that we're talking about are really critical for making a case for why we should use an adaptive management approach in our efforts to bring sagebrush back into these burned landscapes. And um, so this is short shrift for a, a really deep and complex topic. Here's a couple of recent papers from this past year that uh, help um, portray some of the um, the heterogeneity and how we can deal with it in, in management. That's all I have. Great, thanks Matt. All right, if anyone has questions right now for Matt, type them in um, and we will make Robert the presenter. Okay, well, I don't see any immediate questions, so um, I will go ahead and introduce you, Robert. Robert Arkel is a lead ecologist with the USGS Forest and Rangeland Ecosystem Science Center in Boise as well. His research focuses on the response of species and communities to disturbance and restoration in the Intermountain West. Welcome, Robert. Thank you, Janae, for hosting us. Uh, mm -hmm. We did not initially set out to answer questions about uh, resistance and resilience, uh, but this concept is extremely important to future management uh, of the sagebrush ecosystems we have. And we realized that we had a very unique data set to be able to address this issue. So here we are. In Shrublands of the Great Basin, scientists and managers have centered the resistance and resilience discussion around two concepts. For the first, resistance to disturbance, the question is, can an area that's changed by disturbance recover its pre-fire community? With the focus being on big sagebrush and perennial grass recovery. For the second, resistance to cheatgrass invasion, the question is, can the community not change or become cheatgrass dominated, especially after recently burning? <clears throat> 
Research in sagebrush ecosystems suggests that both resistance and resilience should be higher in places with greater soil water availability, places that allow for more native plant growth and reproduction, and at the same time are less favorable for cheatgrass. So what our colleagues have done is pull together information on soil temperature and moisture regimes to create continuous resistance and resilience maps. They've created three versions, but we're going to focus mainly on the simplest map, which shows high resistance and resilience areas in blue, moderate areas in orange, and low R&R areas in gray. You can see that the majority of the Great Basin is in the low category, and that the high category in blue is mainly confined to mountainous areas and the northern part of the Great Basin. Resource managers utilize R&R concepts and these maps specifically to prioritize areas for habitat conservation and restoration, especially as they relate to greater sage grouse habitat. However, whether this theory follows hypothesized relationships in practice is largely untested at this spatial scale. So we wanted to assess whether R&R theory is supported by field data from 1,278 post-fire rehabilitation plots, which we sampled from one to 25 years post-treatment throughout the Great Basin. If R&R maps are good predictors of post-disturbance outcomes, we should see significant differences in vegetation based on which R&R class the plots fall into. So our first question was, does R&R predict resilience to fire? And we quantified resilience in two different ways, sagebrush cover and native perennial grass cover. What we found is that high R&R areas in blue had significantly more sagebrush cover than moderate R&R areas, and moderate had significantly more than low R&R areas in gray. But the difference between moderate and low was uh, smaller and no group on here averaged more than 6% sagebrush cover. Now, since sagebrush is a long-lived, slow-growing species, it gets more interesting when we account for time. So we looked at sagebrush cover across years since treatment and R&R class. These are modeled results showing that on average, high R&R sites in blue have a nice sagebrush recovery traje trajectory. It takes almost two decades for sagebrush cover to reach 10%, the minimum value cited in the sage grouse habitat management guidelines. Also, the high R&R sites having the greatest sagebrush recovery rate and the low sites having the slowest supports the resilience portion of the R&R theory. It would take the moderate sites in orange an average of 65 years to get to 10% sagebrush cover and about 95 years for the low sites in gray. So slow, but positive. I do want to point out that including the error bars around these three lines, you see a lot of overlap. In fact, there isn't a significant, a significant difference between high and low until almost 12 years out. And moderate and low areas don't differ significantly from one another within our 20 year time span. The take home here is that R&R theory does predict recovery rate for resilience but differences between high R&R areas and the others take almost 15 years to manifest and the data don't suggest a difference between uh, moderate and uh, low areas within our 20-year window. Now what if we measure resilience in a different way uh, using native perennial grass cover instead? Well, it turns out that native perennial grass cover was significantly greater in the high R&R sites, the blue bar there, and significantly less in the low R&R sites, the gray, as predicted by R&R theory and the maps. And we found that native perennial grass cover wasn't really strongly related to time since disturbance. They recovered uh, fairly quickly within the first few years. So I'm not gonna show that figure today, but it is uh, interesting. If we can look at it down the road. Next, we tested whether the resistance part of the R&R concept has support by examining cheatgrass cover. On average, high R&R sites, again in blue, have less cheatgrass cover, but still a lot. They average 21% cover, and uh, the low R&R sites in gray had significantly more than the other areas. We found that cheatgrass doesn't really tend to go away with time. 
the cheatgrass in moderate R and R sites, the orange line there, tends to start high and then decline after about five years, which is interesting and, and something we also see with the high R and R sites in blue. The low R and R sites in gray start with more cheatgrass and then they stay relatively flat throughout time. So these findings support the resistance portion of the RNR theory, but on average, all three classes had quite a bit of cheatgrass and there isn't a big decrease with time, except for around year five where native grasses and shrubs might be becoming more competitive or factors at the population level might become more important. Also, uh, these cheatgrass findings suggest that resistance might vary with time since disturbance and that's an interesting concept that we'll need to investigate further. What if we measure uh, resistance using non-natives besides cheatgrass? Well, we found that R&R was not predictive of 12 different non-native herb species or functional groups that excluded cheatgrass. But the cover of these different species was explainable using other biophysical predictor variables. Uh, these findings are likely for two reasons. First, the r, &R maps were developed specifically to assess resistance to cheatgrass and not these other species that we are testing here. Uh, and they, those other species might have different habitat requirements than cheatgrass. Second, none of these other species were as widespread in our plots across the Great Basin as cheatgrass. So we had a lot of zeros in plots that might have been suitable for these other species but they just had not uh, invaded there yet. So we're guessing that when we look at smaller regions or when we only include plots where these species are present, we might see some interesting patterns. Um, an alternative would be developing separate resistant maps for each species of interest. Now that we established support for the resilience of sagebrush and resistance to cheatgrass, we wanted to find out whether we could get more explanatory power if we used R and R maps that have more categories beyond just high, moderate, and low, like the upper map. So we ran the models uh, again, and we ran model uh, the sagebrush model using the other two more detailed maps. We found that the R and R class map, the simple one with just three categories, had slightly more uh, power for predicting sagebrush cover, but the other maps performed uh, quite well too. The difference wasn't that large. For resistance to cheatgrass, the middle map performed slightly better than the other two, uh, but not, not substantially better. So the take home here was that all three map versions had similar predictive power. So uh, resource managers using these maps could likely tailor their um, choice of of how many categories to use uh, to their particular region. Then we asked whether R&R predicts recovery equally well across the Great Basin, or whether in some regions R&R just doesn't work as well. For this analysis, we divided all of our uh, 1,278 plots into the major land resource areas, or MLRAs, where they occur. These uh, MLRAs, which are shown in the lower right, are kind of like ecoregions. When we look at sagebrush recovery rate, we see that within each MLRA, the bars almost always go in the correct order from high having the most to low having the least sagebrush. The data follow the theory really well in the central Nevada MLRA, which is shown here, but not quite as well in uh, some other areas like the Great Salt Lake maybe because of a more monsoonal-like precipitation regime. Uh, we're not sure, but we'll have to look into that further. When we look at resistance to cheatgrass, there is a really nice stair step in the other direction, with high having the least and low having the most sagebrush, and that occurred in every single MLRA. So the data followed the resistance portion of the theory quite well, regardless of which MLRA we're uh, looking at. So our conclusions here are that the r, &R theory was largely supported by the data. Resistance to cheatgrass was lower in low r, &R areas, but there wasn't much as much of a difference between the moderate and high areas. 
Also finding that resistance can change through time potentially was interesting and we'll look into that further. We hadn't really paid much attention to population level processes initially, but uh, they could contribute possibly to the changing resistance values through time. Tomorrow, Bob uh, Shriver will give a fantastic talk about how population processes can affect sagebrush recovery. So be sure to tune in, tune in for that one because uh, I bet that most of us are not thinking about the role of uh, demographics in recovery. Okay, uh, we also found that the r, &R maps were not predictive of other non-natives, so more work will need to be done to determine if that's an artifact of our data or if separate maps need to be developed for each species. Sagebrush resilience through time was greater in high r, &R areas, but there was not as much of a difference between moderate and low. So when you combine the resistance and um, resilience findings, there wasn't always a, a large difference between moderate, high, and low, but for every uh, plant or group of plants that we looked at, r, &R was a significant predictor of cheatgrass, sagebrush, native perennial grass. Um, so r, &R thinking is, is definitely a useful concept for research managers. And as for using r, &R as a predictive tool for post-fire management or restoration, uh, all three versions of the map work well and they would likely be helpful in all MLRAs of the Great Basin. Um, for on the ground decision making and planning, it's important to note that even high r, &R areas are not particularly uh, resistant to cheatgrass and that in these areas, resilience takes almost two decades to become apparent. Um, so I'd like to thank all the co-authors, the collaborators, and many outstanding USGS field technicians that worked on this project with us over the years, and of course, our funding sources. Um, and thank you guys for listening, and be happy to uh, answer questions if there's time. Great, thank you so much, Robert. Yeah, we've got a lot of great questions. Um, first one, could you summarize which low r, &R sites where ESR treatments should not be attempted? We live in a world of finite funds and resources, but often are applying ESR treatments regardless of site characteristics, pre-fire conditions, et cetera. What caused the spike? Oh, I think that's the first question. Yeah, first that's question. Mm -hmm. Right, so, um, Th that's an important issue, and I don't think that we're uh, the data that I presented today will allow us to answer that question. That's um, probably a, a good question for uh, um, a follow-up manuscript on that we're planning, looking at specifically where on the landscape success is more likely. Um, so I think that you know once we get down into that low R and R zone. We are looking at, um, you know, a lower probability of establishing sagebrush and reducing cheatgrass, and so those issues I think are very important. We'll need to address them in a in an entirely new analysis. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, next question: What caused the spike in cheatgrass at the high and moderate uh, categories at around the 10-year mark? Right, uh, that is a, a great question, um, which we're we're trying to think of this in terms of uh, competition from natives, maybe uh, cheek uh, perennial grasses and shrubs is a is one potential reason for that. There might be just changes in in those abundances. The other thing that we're considering is the role of population. So not just the populations of those native competitors, but cheatgrass itself might have uh, some cyclic population um, uh, changes through time, because uh, that, that's correct. We're seeing that increase in the first few years post-fire and then a big decrease in five to 10, and then that another spike after that. So. Um, we're, we're thinking possibly competition, population, demographics, and potentially weather as well. <laughs>
Great, thank you. Um, a comment, the three categories were developed for biome-wide analyses. For specific ecoregional analysis, more refined categories have been developed. For site application, not only soil temperature and moisture is suggested, but also other soil characteristics. That's right, that's a great comment. And um, the literature from uh, Gene Chambers and Jeremy um, Maestas is very explicit on using other cofactors when you go down to smaller and smaller scales of of interest in in using R and R. Um, so you definitely need to take into account other uh, important covariates like elevation, slope, aspect, those kind of things. Um, so it was particularly impressive to me that we were able to explain. Uh, about 30% of the variability in um, in cheatgrass or sagebrush abundance just using these R and R categories and time since disturbance. Uh, quite impressive, yeah, considering we didn't consider any other cofactors. Interesting. Um, okay, next question: How many plots did you have? Did you have in high, moderate, and low categories? Let's see. We had. Here's an example. We had 87 in the high, 164 in the moderate, and a whopping 1,027 in the low. Um, and this is a, a question I'm glad got asked because the distribution of fires in the Great Basin is not um, spread equally across high, moderate, and low R&R &R areas. There's far more fires and subsequent treatments in the low areas, low R&R &R areas of the Great Basin. Um, so we have a much bigger sample size of, of those um, low R&R &R locations, especially when you combine um, low, moderate, and high with time, we start to um, need all of that statistical power that we have with that big sample size. Great, thanks. Um, next question, how does sagebrush canopy cover pre-burn influence resilience and resistance? Is a 15% canopy cover stand pre-burn more resilient and resistant than a 30% canopy cover stand pre-burn? Basically, does sagebrush stand canopy cover impact burn intensity, therefore impacting recovery? Do higher canopy cover stands have a lower seed bank of grasses and forbs and therefore impact recovery and chance of cheatgrass invasion? Sorry, this is so long. <laughs> no, that's a great question. And the answer to that is uh, forthcoming. We're going to use uh, pre-fire vegetation data for all of these plots um, that we're going to get through our, our colleague, Colin Homer, and use those pre-fire vegetation characteristics to assess post-fire outcomes in terms of cheatgrass cover, sagebrush cover, and all those things. Um, so we weren't able to do that just yet, but once those data come in uh, on the pre-fire veg front, we will be able to answer those questions. And it's an important uh, topic to address. Great, thank you. Um, low sagebrush nor understory plant community composition were analyzed here um, in any of the talks, especially Matt's. Has this been addressed in these studies? Low sagebrush uh, and understory community composition. Mm -hmm. um, yes, we've we've got s several sites where low sagebrush was seeded. We also have sites where it was not seeded but was detected in our post-fire sampling. Uh, so we can address uh, issues related to, to low sagebrush, um, both whether it's successfully um, seeded uh, and, and where it occurs in the post-fire landscape. And the same with all of the other uh, uh, herbaceous plant species besides cheatgrass and um, native perennial grasses, which I touched on today. Uh, yeah, we've got some uh, community composition papers planned as well. So all of those factors are important and will, will be addressed. 
Great, thank you. Well, that was the last question. If anyone is still typing, please continue to do so. Um, in the meantime, great discussion, everyone. Thank you all for your participation. And please join us tomorrow for the next three Sage Success Highlight presentations on post-fire recovery gradients associated with soil and biocrust characteristics, sage rush population trajectory trajectories after restoration and to plant or to seed that is a good question by Dave Bernard, Bob Shriver and Dave Pike uh, respectively. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three question survey that will appear after the webinar has ended. I will post the recording of this webinar on our Great Basin Fire Science YouTube channel this afternoon or tomorrow morning and the link will be automatically sent to you through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow. If you have further questions regarding this or other webinars, please email or call me anytime. Um, and just comments, uh, good presentation, guys. So thanks. Um, again, thank you all for attending this webinar. And thank you, David, Matt, and Robert for presenting. All right. Have a great day, everybody.